this providers forum. Uh, Rob, can I be given uh, presenter rights, please? Yes, certainly. Um, you are now a co-host. I'm putting all the other speakers and co-hosts as well. Excellent. Thank you. We'll wait a few more minutes. I see people are still trickling in. Just a preliminary check. Can people see my slides? Yep. And now, are they moving? Mm, no. No, no, not really. Um, it's not in presentation mode either. That's odd. Um, okay, the blocking thing seems to be gone now, but it's not yet in presentation mode. I no, guess we can live with this. This is fine. Great. Uh, a few housekeeping, uh, which you're probably familiar with uh, at the moment. So uh, this event's being recorded. Uh, we will share links to the recordings afterwards. Uh, please ensure that your microphone is uh, switched off, uh, video to, uh, unless the host gives you permission. And please, after speaking, uh, ensure it's uh, switched off once again. Um, for interaction, uh, please, if you'd like to say something, raise your hand lower afterwards. Uh, the Zoom chat is available to write any questions that you have. Uh, also, uh, with many thanks to the uh, people organizing this event, we do have Slido as well, um, and we will be using uh, a poll uh, for this uh, shortly. Uh, so to enter Slido, uh, use the code EOSC Hub Week, and then select 20th of May uh, Service Providers Forum. Uh, first of all, I'm wondering if we can actually uh, launch the first uh, poll, uh, Rob, which is to check the profile of people um, at this event. Okay, it's, it's live now. So this is a question, what's your role? Are you a service provider within academic infrastructure, service provider, um, other service provider outside academic uh, context, an end user uh, or other? So if you could uh, vote, that would be good. And we see at the moment, 
predominantly service providers within academic uh, infrastructures, which is interesting. few outside as well. So that gives us a quite a good understanding of uh, the background of the people here. Great. Okay, uh, so um, to say a few words about the outline of this session, uh, we will have, uh, which is what I hope, a number of topics relevant for service providers. Uh, after a bit of background from me about what the Service Provider Forum is all about, we will have Giuseppe uh, telling us about the training which is available for service providers. Uh, Gerge uh, speaking some more about a very interesting uh, handbook that he's been working on, which is integration uh, handbook and the benefits of service providers for integrating with the core services. Uh, this has been mentioned before, but I'm hoping that this will be a chance for Gerge to give us a bit more information uh, about that. Uh, afterwards, uh, Dave Kelsey, uh, we'll be talking about uh, security activities um, and policies of EOSC relevant to service providers. And finally, I'll be saying something about an uh, initiative that uh, we've recently uh, launched, which is uh, the start of a series of surveys uh, for service providers uh, to understand um, um, their uh, issues, their pains, the things that they like about EOSC, which uh, will help us drive the remainder of the uh, project and afterwards as well uh, in the um, projects uh, uh, starting after EOSC Hub comes to an end. Uh, so to start with um, an overview of operations related activities within EOSC Hub. Uh, so operations coordination um, is a very important uh, activity here, which is really overseeing the integration and production delivery of services from uh, both uh, partners within EOSC Hub and uh, service providers outside EOSC Hub as well. Operations coordination also covers uh, the uh, dealing of uh, orders that come in uh, and also uh, th these are orders of services ensuring that these uh, orders are understood and then fulfilled by allocating them to service providers. Uh, also the uh, management of the help desk, the first line support, the first line triage, and also the second line uh, expert support. The development of the service management system uh, is another key component uh, behind uh, operations. So uh, this includes the, uh, the development from scratch of this uh, SMS, uh, which uh, includes service coordination and planning processes. Uh, this is a service portfolio management, uh, continuous service improvements and customer relations management to uh, name a few of these. Um, and also uh, the operational processes, the capacity management, instant and service request management and change management. Um, as I say, these have been set up from scratch and um, part of the project is actually understanding how we're doing um, in meeting the requirements of FITSM, which is the standard we use to guide us to create these, uh, uh, these processes. Um, and we've had a, um, earlier on in the project, we had an internal audit uh, to understand how we are meeting these uh, standard requirements. And there will be another uh, audit as well towards the end of the uh, project. We do not expect it to be completely advanced and mature um, since um, in many cases, uh, this is a work that uh, has only been uh, going uh, for a year, a year and a half, sometimes two years. Uh, but we really uh, do want to know um, how we're doing at the end of the project to be able to pass it on to the follow on project um, and uh, further mature uh, the service management system. Um, the, it's worth saying that this service management system um, uh, is for all services, although it's predominantly for the EOSC core services. Many of these uh, aspects like change management, et cetera, um, are for the EOSC core and would not be for external uh, services that are onboarded. But there are aspects of the service management system uh, that are as well uh, for the uh, external services, so service portfolio management. Clearly, uh, the information about the services that we're onboarding is very critical. 
um, and also aspects of uh, information uh, security management as well. Um, it'll come as no surprise that the onboarding is a very important part of our operations activities as well. And also the, the active rules of participation uh, is incredibly important from a practical point of view. We need to know what the rules are for onboarding. Uh, therefore, this cannot be abstract. It needs to be very practical so the onboarding teams can uh, gauge the suitability uh, of services that do request uh, onboarding. On the next slide, uh, you see um, uh, how the uh, services uh, fit in. Essentially, uh, the role of them is to uh, um, um, bring the service pr producers uh, with the service uh, consumers. Uh, it underpins the entire research life cycle uh, from data collection, to data processing, storage, preservation, publication, and reuse uh, of data. It's very, very uh, core to what EOSC is all about. And you see the uh, EOSC uh, core services um, and the EOSC exchange services um, and externally onboarded services which are added to EOSC exchange and can make use of the core services as well. In the next uh, slide, um, a bit more information about the service providers themselves and EOSC. Uh, they are very uh, core. They've been identified as key stakeholders by the Commission in the implementation roadmap for the EOSC, along with data uh, producers and the end users as well. Uh, some factors that are needed for uh, the success is uh, clear requirements need to be communicated uh, for onboarding. Um, and I've uh, added a link at the bottom uh, where those requirements are. Um, the availability of these EOSC core services uh, for integration by uh, the uh, EOSC exchange services is also a very important uh, uh, factor here. The General harmonization of user experience. This is key to what uh, uh, EOSC is all about. So um, one place to discover services, one place to order services, one place to get uh, help uh, um, if needed, um, etc. cetera. Um, but also um, the harmonization of the maturity as well uh, by having a control of a minimum maturity level of services which are unboarded. Uh, relationship, uh, of course, is very, very important between uh, service providers and the EOSC. Uh, it's also critical that the expectations are understood um, and managed um, and that there is a, a healthy degree of engagement uh, with uh, projects developing and running the EOSC. Uh, so um, the uh, role of the service providers forum uh, is uh, um, uh, is, is really um, what uh, dealing with the communication needs between the project um, and the service providers. Uh, so communication is important during the initial onboarding. Um, it's important, uh, of course, uh, um, um, at um, events, uh, projects and partners and infrastructures, uh, possible ways of interaction, um, as well as the uh, um, uh, other ways that are provided by the service providers forum, uh, the mailing list, uh, which is a very lightweight communication uh, between the project and service providers, uh, events, webinars, trainings, or other uh, possibilities for interaction. Um, also the increased awareness of what the actual core services uh, actually are. Uh, we see uh, the service providers absolutely critical as well as providing EOSC with an independent, uh, indirect access to the users themselves, uh, and also uh, in fostering a, a community of practice uh, as well, the concept which has been used within the EOSC strategic research and innovation uh, agenda. Um, on the right hand side, you can see the different types of information flow from the project to the service uh, providers. Uh, so this uh, uh, awareness, training, integration, uh, support of uh, the usage of the EOSC core services, dissemination of uh, information uh, as listed um, there and also from the service providers back uh, requirements collection uh, any problems concerns regarding um, the the project uh, EOSC itself uh, also feedback to the project from the service providers and users uh, and of course this is very very key for a general continuous uh, improvement uh, so that was my general introduction uh, to the session 
Um, I would suggest uh, that we move on to the uh, individual talks because I have scheduled um, um, a discussion and questions and answers at the end. And I hope that this will be as interactive um, as possible because these are very much dealing with the needs of the service providers. So with that, I would like to move on to the first talk, which is, uh, I think, um, let me just check. Uh, this is the training relevant for the service providers um, and Giuseppe. Can we make Giuseppe the presenter? Yes, you should be able to already. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Rob. Uh, so Giuseppe, you have the floor. Okay, so I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so good, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> thank you, uh, Matthew, for inviting me to, to report uh, the status of the training uh, material available for service provider. Uh, so my name is Giuseppe La Rocca. I'm a cloud, uh, sorry, I'm a community support and team lead at the Foundation. And in uh, IOSCA, I'm responsible for the engagement uh, and uh, training uh, activities in, in, in the project. So, so what we should do in uh, WP11, which is the work package uh, related to the training activities to uh, organize and deliver training, uh, training events to target the needs of uh, our st main stakeholders. Uh, basically, uh, our target users are here represented by individual researchers and the scientific communities. Of course, we focus particular attention to the community that uh, are involved in the project. I'm referring to the uh, competence center and thematic services. Uh, but we are also keeping, keeping an eye also on an external community outside the project. In the past, for example, we contributed to support uh, training activity of the Codata at the school. Uh, we also uh, provide support for, uh, to run the International Bioinformatics School uh, and the Virgo Winter School and many, many others. Uh, of course, also service providers are uh, um, our uh, main important uh, stakeholders. So we would like to, to offer uh, material and support in order to uh, be um, federated with the EOSC uh, uh, ecosystem. So integrate their system, extend, for example, the uh, AI framework, uh, um, etc., with, with EOSC in order to offer the services to a wider audience. Uh, so this is, uh, in a nutshell, basically the goal of these uh, uh, work packages, what, what we usually do. Uh, the, all the material, uh, uh, including the a calendar of a training event, can be available uh, through our uh, EOSC training registry, which is available uh, in, um, in the EOSC Hub website. So you can navigate the, the menu and then you can find the link to uh, where you can find the uh, information about the upcoming events and also available material. Uh, in terms of uh, ma material, training material that we can offer for service provider, you can see um, a list of uh, uh, topics. Uh, we, the first uh, topic is uh, about the IT security forensics training. So basically we have a, a security group expert that uh, usually organize um, I focus the event to to to, uh, to to inform you to how to uh, protect your data center from the uh, security attacks. Uh, more details probably will be also uh, introduced by Dave in uh, his uh, uh, talk. Uh, we are also providing IT federated service management talk based on a Peterson standard for helping the uh, service provider to uh, improve the professional um, design, planning, operation, and uh, delivery of services to the, to the end user. And basically, we, we run three different types of um, uh, IT SM um, service uh, training events. Uh, we started the first year with the foundation events, 
And starting from the second year, we, we organized also advanced events. So the plan is also to have an expert uh, uh, courses uh, before the end of the, of the project. And the, the last uh, um, groups of um, event and material that we can uh, provide, we, we can offer, are material about, uh, training material about common and federated services, which represent uh, uh, the basic building blocks uh, that we can offer to, to be interoperable with the EOSC. Uh, here includes uh, uh, material for the uh, authentication, the AI. Today there will be a dedicated session chaired by Nicholas and uh, Pavel uh, Weber, starting from uh, uh, 2.30 p.m. Uh, we have information and material to uh, interact with the EOSC uh, uh, cloud infrastructure, uh, storage, online storage data, um, data uh, platform for handling the PID, metadata discovery, publishing and archiving initiative data, and also uh, pass orchestrator. So all this material, as I mentioned before, will be available through the um, uh, training registry. What is coming next is, is to uh, update a little bit uh, the, uh, how this information will be presented to the, to the uh, end user and our stakeholders. So this, uh, this is a new mock-up of the portal that will come on, uh, live in a couple of days. We still need to, to refine and do some quality check before to make this uh, officially available. As you, as you can see, the information will be organized into different uh, uh, section, one for the research communities and the one for the service provider. The plan is to increase the user experience and clicking on the uh, service provider there will be uh, additional, uh, um, all the information will be grouped on a different uh, uh, categories. So there will be some uh, uh, overview, generic overview information about the technical architecture of EOSC, uh, instruction how to become a service provider, uh, information about how to uh, interact with the operation tools offered by EOSC, uh, the IT um, security forensics, FITSM, and also external documentation, additional documentation. And this, that's all. So this is basically the information that I would like to give you so far. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Giuseppe. One question I would have is, uh, can you uh, say something about uh, how you actually gauge what the needs are in order to provide the different types of training? So, yes. <clears throat> so basically, uh, every year, the WP11 usually collect uh, training needs from the different uh, uh, partners involved in the project. So based on this requirement, we usually create a calendar of training events and uh, this is the calendar of event that we usually organize and deliver every year. Uh, this calendar of event is basically a, a live document, so we are able any time to update <coughs> the, <coughs> the list of events with additional topics if there is a request from a particular community or in this case also a service provider. So uh, we are open to any um, input and suggestion to, to make this uh, training, catalog, training event uh, 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 <clears throat> more appealing for, for, for the different user. Thanks, Giuseppe. Do we have any other questions for Giuseppe before we move on? Either in the chat or by raising one's hand or unmuting if you can. Okay. If not, then I think we can move on to uh, to Gerge, uh talking about the EOS Cub Integration Handbook for Service Providers. Can we make Gerge the presenter? Can you? See the screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, good morning. Uh, thank you for the invitation for giving a pitch talk about this new document that the project produced. 
integration handbook for service providers. And we came up with this idea because there is a large number of projects and actually a growing number of projects on the EOSC landscape, which somehow has in their plan to bring in services into EOSC through the hub, which was quite a recurring term or sentence in many of the calls that the Horizon 2020 program included. And we have the demand from all of these projects to explain them how to bring services into EOSC through the hub and what it actually means. So we came up with the idea to describe all the information you need to know to answer that question. And that document is now available. You can see the DOI link through the node on the slide. The slide is available in the session uh, agenda today, so you can already access the document itself. Clearly the target audiences of this document are those projects or institutes or consortia that wants to bring in services into EOSC through the hub, but also it's relevant to those who already have services in EOSC through the hub, but now they want to fully understand other options and possibilities they can do with the EOSC hub services. The document itself covers a number of areas because it aims to be really a compact self-containing document. It starts with an introduction of EOSC and the EOSC hub project, exactly describing what EOSC hub does on the EOSC landscape and why it's relevant and why someone needs to know about EOSC hub in order to integrate into the EOSC portal. It talks about the first step of integrating into EOSC, which is onboarding in the EOSC portal, which is the must to do step for providers. And then it goes into additional options that are offered as a kind of a la carte menu by EOSC hub for service providers. And these a la carte items cover things like integration with the so-called federation services, which I will briefly talk, into, uh, talk about. Services that help providers manage research data, alignment and in integration with the service management system. And also it closes with the future outlook section, what to do and what to expect after EOS Hub is over. So it's quite a comprehensive document. And let me just show you the document itself, which is available in, in, in Zenodo through the link. So that's the landing page you see. And I'm glad to see that since it was published two days ago, we already had 65 downloads. And actually today, a project which is on the EOSC landscape started tweeting about it. And the tweet says that this is a must read for our project. Um, so let me show you the document itself. Uh, it looks like, so the introduction as it talks about the project, the main areas that it does, delivering services that X, the glue, the central elements, the core services in EOSC, uh, delivering additional compute storage data management and science discipline specific thematic services, providing a service management system, and basically simplifying the EOSC landscape for users by working with providers on harmonized access policies, licenses, and so on. And then basically the main part of the document is integration with these items. So first section is about how to register in the EOS portal, talking about what are the kind of basic criteria for onboarding in the EOS portal, and then what's the process itself, which is going through the forms that are available on the website. The next section is about federating with the, or integrating with the federation services, where the first one is the federated user authentication. Each of these federated services are described in the same style, basically starting with a what it is type section, explaining what the federated user authentication means in the EOS context, then talking about why to use it, justifying and answering the question, why should I care? Why should I integrate with that particular service in EOSC? And then talking about how to integrate with that service, where possible and where available, we point to more detailed technical documentation, which is very often in Confluence or in some similar systems. And then uh, 
in case of further questions, you can ask assistance. So the AEI is the first topic. The second is availability and reliability monitoring following the same style. Uh, here under this section, we talk about, for example, how to integrate with the reliability monitoring in a way that's suitable and test your service from the perspective of your user's relevance. So for example, we point to the reusable test probes that you can just choose from and quickly activate. Also show you the page where you can learn about how to develop customized probes in order to deal with and test your service from situations and from perspective that's currently not in the portfolio. And then how to activate the monitoring uh, of your service. The user accounting is the third federated service which is covered here. The focus of the current capabilities of the accounting is on high throughput compute accounting, infrastructure service cloud accounting, storage and data set uh, accounting. And under this section, we point to documentation on what should be the parsers that you should activate on your service in order to extract usage information and accounting information in the format expected by the accounting system, how to feed those uh, extracted information into the accounting system, and again, how to ask for assistance. The last one is the help desk, which is relevant for providers who don't have their own help desk yet and would like to hook into the EOSC help desk in order to, to be able to respond to user questions there. After this federated services section, the next one is a relatively short one talking about the broad set of services that we provide for providers to deal with research data. And basically, the, this relatively short section just positions all those services that EOSC Hub offers along this virtuous research cycle, uh, mentioning roughly the services for each stage, pointing to the marketplace where you can find entries about each of these services with a short description of what they are good for and suggesting you to ask for assistance from the EOS Hub technical uh, support team to identify exactly the, that portfolio of services from this landscape that are relevant for your use case. The next section is about aligning with the service management system which is basically starting with a generic introduction of what is IT service management, why is important, talking about the standard, namely FITSM, that is underpinning the EOSC IT or EOSC Hub IT service management system, detailing the different processes which drive the documentation and guidances and policy in the EOSC Hub IT service management system, and then showing you some examples of how you actually can implement or should implement IT service management. Also illustrating how you eventually already partly implement service management when you onboard into the EOS portal and follow the guidelines. And the document closes with a future outlook, which is basically talking about what do we expect to happen after EOS Hub is over, talking about the working groups, mentioning explicitly the architecture working group that is currently discussing and suggesting EOSC on the federating core or the minimum viable EOSC that will basically decide what will be the core elements of EOSC after 2020. Uh, other parts of this section talk about the currently open Horizon 2020 cores that will influence the operation of this minimum viable EOSC that will influence the additional services in EOSC. And uh, basically, we also talk about the projects that are on the EOSC landscape and how we see them fitting onto this uh, current uh, EOSC portal um, structure. So that's the document that I wanted to point you to, and I encourage you to go to the Zenodo link and uh, start using it. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Gergé. The question I would have is, um, at what point would you see on the uh, life cycle interacting with EOSC a, 
uh, a service, an external service, would would actually integrate with these uh, with these core services. So what I mean is, uh, would you view them first onboarding and then integrating, or first integrating and then onboarding, or a mixture of both? Either any thoughts on that? My my feeling and my experience is that it really depends on the service, and I tell you why, because some of the services kind of do not need additional capabilities to serve new users through EOSC. They can just simply onboard, make themselves present in the EOSC portal, and with the already available capacity that they have and the features they have, they can already serve new communities through the EOSC delivery channel. In that case, just go for the simplistic onboarding and consider integration maybe later as you see the demand growing for the service and you may be run out of capacity, for example. Other services may not be in a stage that they can scale up immediately to serve larger number of users. In that case, they need to plan ahead already for this expected demand and therefore they may, for example, want to integrate with a compute cloud or external storage in order to be able to cater for the extra users that will come in through the channel. In those cases, they should do the integration before they actually make the service publicly available through the portal. So I think it it's, it's really depends on the current, on the actual situation of the service. Sure. Uh, is there any other question? Um, I see there's one from Dushan. So it means that no integration with the services from the EOS core would be required during the onboarding process, only registration with the catalog. So in that case, uh, I think Yes, yes. The the if there's yeah. a service which is fully functioning, yeah. although it may be the case that you would want to choose to integrate and then uh, onboard, so it really depends uh, on the service in question. Are there any other questions? And uh, I, I can note that anybody can uh, unmute themselves. We have quite a manageable number of people, not in the hundreds, 66, so feel free to unmute mute if you have, um, especially if you have uh, responses over the kind of information that would be uh, Please only uh, unmute if you'd like. Um, perhaps it would be better to um, maybe have them raise their hands and then we can unmute them uh, one by one. Okay, excellent. Okay, uh, so let's move on then to uh, Dave Kelsey, who will be talking about uh, aspects of security and policy. Okay, can I just check that you can hear me? Very well, yeah. So I'm experiencing internet instability this morning. <laughs> I just crashed out 10 minutes ago. So I think actually, Where is the, uh... well, we'll see how we go anyway, but if I disappear, <laughs> you know that's what's happening. Anyway, so I'm gonna talk about uh, security. Can you see my slides all right? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, so the first thing to note is that we had a session yesterday in this EOSC Hub virtual week. So there was a, a full security session. So I refer you to that and the recording and the slides and everything for, for more details. So within the EOSC Hub project, within Work Package 4, there's a task four which is charged with um, taking care of the information security management process within the service management system. And so we're responsible for all operational security aspects of the, uh, the EOSC Hub um, collaboration. So there's a couple of slides here just saying what are the sort of things we do. So, okay, so we did develop and implement and maintain the policies and procedures within the service management system. The main scope of those is that they apply to the, uh, the core services, the EOS hub services, not directly to the boarding services, but we'll talk about that. 
um, we're charged with uh, providing consistent and coordinated security operations across the various services and infrastructures within the EOS hub environment. Um, we have to base everything on an up-to-date policy framework. Um, the aim is, of course, that we're not doing everything in security. We're relying on the infrastructure security activities and indeed the best practice that we assume that service providers will be um, following security best practices and uh, we want to work together with them and to complement what they're doing. So we, uh, we have an instant response task force um, to make sure that including those incidents that happen within services, um, which of course is the main place where um, services can happen. Um, we have specialized expertise in forensics, so we can help people if they want to understand what's going on in an instance. And we also coordinate large scale incidents across. Uh, Dave, you're breaking up a little bit. Perhaps it would be safer if you uh, stop sending video. I take it other people can hear me. Or is it just Dave we've lost? Yeah. Only Dave who we lost. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to contact him. So I'm also involved uh, to some extent in the security work, but unfortunately I haven't uh, had a chance to review Dave's slides. So <laughs> I don't know if there's a, a backup uh, person who's also involved uh, with these uh, slides. No. In that case, let me bring them up. Okay, well, I'm hoping that he will come back. But in the meantime, uh, what I would say is that we should move on to the uh, Q&A session. Um, and we do actually have another poll in Sligo um, that perhaps we can uh, pull up, which is touching about the information uh, flow and whether people feel it is adequate that is coming to the service providers uh, from EOSC. Uh, uh, Rob, if possible, then we can uh, move on to this poll. Sure, it's showing now. Actually, maybe I can present that as well. It's quite a simplistic question. What's your opinion of the level of communication to service providers from EOSC? Is it not enough about right or too much? So overwhelmingly, it's uh, not enough. I'll be very interested to get the opinion of people who are responding as not enough to try to understand the 
kind of information that you would like to see more of? Is it uh, documentation? Is it uh, development information status of uh, what's happening uh, or what? So um, if anybody would be happy to uh, suggest anything, then please do. Any takers? Uh, please raise your hands, be unmuted. I, th I guess, Rob, that we'll be able to unmute people and see when they're raising their hands. Certainly. Um, let us know as well if you're having trouble finding the uh, functionality. So I've just given everybody the uh, possibility once again to unmute themselves. So kind of information um you'd like to see um if you feel it's insufficient i mean this could be in the form of uh, um webinars uh, additional training um more uh, information about what the actual core services are and how to use them Okay, we have um, Irena. You have now been unmuted. Yes, uh, hi, um, Irena speaking. Uh, I'm from uh, Sesda Eric, uh, representing one of the service providers. Uh, I would just like to know uh, to tell you that you know what what we see in, in in the community is that not only the service providers are not aware about what EOSC is dying, but researchers are really really not aware, and uh, I'm just wondering. Uh, through which channels, uh, I mean, to have a, a kind of an open discussion, to, through which channels should we actually fit this information uh, to researchers about what EOSC is? Because obviously they are not following, you know, the EOSC online. So I'm just wondering what you're doing in relation to whether you're populating information EOSC through, I don't know, their um, kind of their communities, you know, through, through the research communities, uh, what is EOSC doing for them? Thanks. Mm -hmm. so it's a good point. Uh, so I think this uh, depends um, in many uh, cases on, on, the, on the actual circumstance of the community. If they're already using services um, that um, are being integrated into the wider EOSC, you could say that they needn't actually know uh, that much about using EOSC itself um, on the virtue that the services that they are using may be additionally integrated behind the scenes with, for example, AAI to make it easier to um, interact with other services so they could be indirectly using uh, EOSC. Um, alternatively, uh, if they are not already using uh, services within their community, uh, we absolutely should make them aware of the services that they can discover through the EOSC uh, portal, uh, because this could be the, the first port of call uh, for them. Uh, either way, I think uh, it really depends on proper marketing of what we're doing, what the benefits are of the portal to them and how they can discover services that could be of use to them. I think in the first category, that's probably going to take a little bit longer before the benefits are indirectly propagated to them through their community services. I hope that uh, um, uh, is clear. Can I, can I add another pro um, 
suggestion, and I don't know whether it's uh, already done, but as you said, you know, the, the, it's really important that this is really uh, communicated well. And I was wondering if, if EOSC uh, has or is thinking of uh, doing uh, short videos on, on what EOSC is doing for different communities. So we could eventually, when we have um, events uh, for researchers, um, play these kind of videos. Uh, so yeah, instead of doing it ourselves and you know, sometimes you don't explain things correctly. So I'm wondering if there are any promotion videos being done by EOSC. As far as EOSC Hub is concerned, I'm not aware of anything. Maybe uh, somebody from uh, Trust IT can um, say anything about this, but this is most certainly something that we could be doing. I know it's something that uh, some other projects are doing, and this is something that could be incorporated uh, into the following in for EOSC 03. Um, if anybody from uh, uh, Trust IT would like to add to that, then please do. Uh, sorry, could you just repeat the question? I was providing support to David, who has just rejoined us. Now, actually, I'm making him a co-host, but uh, could you just uh, repeat the question, please? Uh, so the question really is one of uh, provision of, uh, of, of videos as a way of promoting uh, what we're doing at, and the services. Ah, uh, yes, certainly. Um, so um, videos would certainly be interesting. Um, it's, it's from what we've seen, um, uh, you know, providing communication support to a lot of these uh, projects since the start, um, there has been an increase in the preference for videos, um, both from, you know, the, let's say the audience standpoint, because, um, you know, it, it, it allows people to see and understand, you know, a whole lot of information in just a matter of a few minutes. Um, the difficulty, however, is, you know, it, it depends, of course, um, from provider to provider, but it's um, you know, it, it takes, it does take quite a bit of resources to produce even just um, a few minutes of video. So um, it, it's, and also another thing is that um, audiences have a certain expectation now on, on, you know, what, what the, the visual sh uh, in a video should be. So, um, you know, it's, it's not just, you know, the producing a video, let's say like a, like a set of slides and then just, uh, moving from one slide to the next. Um, people do expect a certain level of quality now from videos. So on one hand, yes, it is a great um, tool um, to communicate. Um, but on the other hand, it, it's, it's also something that, that, is, um, that takes quite a bit of resources to, to produce, especially if you want to do it right. So thanks to Giuseppe, uh, who's given me the point to, to a number of videos that have already been uh, created. Uh, thematic uh, level videos. Uh, this is something that is active, is it Giuseppe, creating these videos so we can provision for more? Uh, yeah, this is uh, something that we need probably to to produce more in the <clears throat> in the next part of the project uh, because this is just to promote what we are doing so far. This is just an example of uh, um, what uh, this community uh, uh, managed to integrate thanks to the support of the OSCAP. So uh, as soon as the, the other thematic services and also competence center will be mature enough, probably we can have more about video and make this available for our channel. Sure. Thanks for that. Um, Matt, in the meantime... uh, it's Pavel Viba. I would like to add a short comment. Uh, I really like this idea about the videos and uh, I can say that probably it's also important to produce um, sort of uh, technical videos, tutorials, and this is currently being done, for example, in AI group. Today it will be a training where a sort of um, demos will be shown how to, how to, uh, to describe in different uh, workflows the users can uh, um, take. And um, I think I will also use this idea to promote it in their uh, federation, um, uh, services so that the uh, product teams could think about it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Thanks, Pablo. Uh, I think we'd better move on because in the meantime, Dave Kelsey uh, has come back so we can try to see whether um, uh, pre presenting will work for him. Are you connected uh, in a way that you could present or would you like us to drive your slides, uh, Dave? I think I should be able to do it. Apologies for that. I've had eight weeks of stable 
internet during lockdown and it goes while I'm giving a talk. This is great, isn't it? <laughs> so now I'm connected by my mobile phone and I've no idea whether this will <laughs> seems to like work. To Shall I just carry on where, where I got to? Yeah, if you could do, that would be good. Um, um, so, so I need to share my screen, don't I? Uh, we will have time for more questions and answers. I know some more have come in the meantime. Yeah, I'll, tr I'll try and rush through this as quickly as possible. So can you see my slides now? Uh, yes. I think this is where I got to. So I was talking about uh, building trust with, inter with, with others as being an important part of the activity. So we tried to do everything under the auspices of the WISE community, the WISE Information Security for E-Infrastructures and the various um, identity management uh, bodies and uh, with Jayant 4-3, et cetera, et cetera, and security groups elsewhere as well. Um, there are other security related activities, tools, monitoring and AI that are not part of the WP4 activity, but are clearly important and go on elsewhere. And Giuseppe said, I might give you more information about the security training. I was somehow assuming he would do that. So <laughs> I should have talked to him. Um, but just to say that it's not just forensics training that we do. We have a, a whole range of um, security training, uh, a portfolio of um, offensive and defensive and role play and what have you so i think uh, that's something that would be good if you know particular services feel they need security training they should talk to us and we'd be happy to to see if this can be uh, this can be achieved and as i said before the scope is is those uh, um if, you know for the policies and things within the service management system the scope is definitely the core services the hub portfolio but we encourage others other onboarding services to adopt the policies and work to their requirements um, because they are a good uh, specification of uh, best practice. And, um, but, and, and if they find they can't, if they're, if they're not able to adopt those policies, it would be good to have the feedback on why they cannot because maybe we can change them to, uh, to meet those needs. Um, so where are we now? So yes, yeah, so I said that we do everything under WISE. Um, this gives us the ability of building policies which are not only acceptable within the EOSC um, ecosystem, but also more broadly. And that means that they're more likely to be applicable to the ecosystem within EOSC as well, because they, uh, lots, of, lots of infrastructures participate in the wording of the policies, so they're more likely to be acceptable. So we use this security for collaborating infrastructures, trust framework, version two of which was published in 2017. So now I'm gonna talk about what the policies are for, with, for security. Um, there are three within the service management system. There's the top level policy, which I'll say no more about today. That's mainly just the, the, the attitude of the uh, the management of the infrastructures towards policy and stuff. The two that actually apply to end user participants and to services are first of all the AUP, the acceptable use policy and conditions of use, and then the service operation security policy. And I'll talk a bit about each of those. So a lot of this is building on the work that came out of the the Horizon 2020 ARC projects and their policy development kit. This is the authentication and authorization for research collaborations. And they did a very nice job of actually uh, producing standard template policies. And so we, and WISE has then taken that on board. So the, the baseline AUP is what we actually adopt within EOSC Hub. Um, and there's a good guidance document there, that guidelines version 40, I044 is, you know, if you want to read all about the baseline AUP, look to that. But the idea of using a common baseline AUP means that it's much simpler for the end user. They only see one AUP. It's, it's simpler for services and infrastructures. They don't have to completely develop a new AUP from scratch. Um, and if, to the extent that new services are offering uh, services to new communities, the fact that everybody's abi abiding by the same AUP uh, makes it easier for onboarding of users into services as well as, uh, so it's easier from the service point of view as well as the, the user point of view. And gradually more and more infrastructures we see are adopting this. And so for those services, it's sort of mandatory for the, the, the core hub services, but for those who are external and looking to uh, adopt an AUP, we uh, encourage you to consider using this, uh, this template. 
and you can then add your own privacy notice and other service conditions. If I've got time, I'll just quickly go through. So here is the, the WISE baseline AUP, and you'll see at the bottom there it says, so when using this, the curly brackets in blue indicate text which should be replaced as appropriate by whoever is adopting the AUP, and those in coloured in green are optional and can be added or deleted as, as applicable. So for example, here you see in the, the introductory paragraph, it says, as granted by, and there's the ability then to put in a name of whoever the service is or the, uh, whoever's offering it and describing the purpose as well. And then the green bit is that you can actually add um, additional rules or conditions or references to additional rules or conditions that you need to do. The idea is that you don't actually change the wording of the one to 10 bullet points for of the baseline AUP, but you add things around it. And so clearly what you add shouldn't conflict with what's already there. So again, that we're, we're kind of short of time, I guess. I don't know how much of this, we could come back to it if people ask questions about it, but here are the, the 10 bullet, po bullet points of the baseline AUP, and they address those aspects which we thrashed out for about a year or so within the ARC project and, a, and, um, and WISE as to what, what needed to be in and what shouldn't be in. And unless everybody would agree, we didn't put it in, right? So, so these are the things which uh, everybody seems to agree are good to have in your AUP. Um, and at the end, you're then allowed to uh, insert additional number clauses if you've got things that you wish to add. Um, you then specify the admin contact, security contact, and a link to your privacy statement and any applicable service level agreements if you have those as well. So then moving on to the service operations. Again, this is based on the, the version of the template coming out of the, the ARC policy development kit. The same thing, the scope, it applies to all the core hub services, but uh, we encourage others to, to consider adhering to it and providing feedback on any problems they find with them so in case we need to change things. Statements are all reasonable according to accepted best practice. They meet the requirements of the WISE SCI trust framework and include collaboration with the infrastructure and the security teams. I mean, obviously the place where we're likely to get security instance is in the services, right? So, so we, if you have a security instance, we want to hear about it. The security team wants to work with you. Um, if you're happy to handle it all, that's fine, but we'd like to collaborate with you. And again, this is based on some simple, simple points. There are eight points here that are in this service operation security policy, but it says things like you will support security instant response and you'll collaborate with the security team. You're held responsible for safe and secure operation. You'll follow best practices, including patching and updating, etc. There's a statement about uh, GDPR privacy notice, which of course all services by law must have. Um, and then about access and who can, um, can control your access or how uh, the infrastructure offering you a hosting point for the, uh, your service can um, control your access. So that's, uh, that's all in place. In terms of future work for the rest of the, uh, the project year, we will do everything still within the WISE SCI working group to build consensus with a broader range of infrastructures. Um, we are working on an updated policy template. EGI has a policy template uh, as a policy for community responsibilities. And we need to try and see what is applicable in the sort of EOSC environment and the broader environment, if anything. I mean, we might decide we just don't need those policies, but we're looking into that. We're going to update the top level security policy because there are some additions needed. And we've got, um, again, work on the data protection for GDPR compliance and uh, updating the uh, existing uh, policy templates on there. And uh, I note that if the Géant Code of Conduct version two becomes approved and adopted, then we would have to, to change our policy again because we would just tie people to that. So I think, um, Matthew, that's all I, I wanted to say. Um, I hope that's included all you wanted me to include. Thank you, Dave. That was very good, very useful. Question is, um, did 
did it cover the the needs of the people uh, the service providers uh, and uh, is it is it clear are there any questions regarding these this work on the policies I sometimes think that uh, these policies um, are quite a tricky area um, and until somebody actually sees examples of what they actually cover, um, it can be a little bit intractable to, to, to understand what is actually needed, especially from somebody who is interested in onboarding. And unfortunately, the real audience, that I think, who needs to know this, are the people already struggling with onboarding rather than the people who are actually uh, part of the project and probably on this call. Nevertheless, if there are any uh, questions uh, for Dave, And indeed, if anybody wants to discuss offline afterwards, we'd, we'd like to hear from you if there are things you'd like help with, or if there are things you want us to do, or things, uh, please do feedback. Okay. Thanks again. Uh, I'll move back to uh, me as the presenter then uh, for the last uh, uh, section. Just... Uh, Share my screen once again. Okay, I take it you can see my screen. Yes. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to uh, um, finish off by saying something about the service provider survey uh, that we distributed to onboarded service providers. Uh, during May. Um, this was a short uh, survey uh, where we allowed anonymous feedback to be given. Uh, we didn't also ask for the onboarding date as well, uh, which uh, in retrospect I think we, we should have done. Uh, one of the things that we uh, wanted to get feedback on was the actual onboarding process itself. And onboarding is something that has developed from absolutely nothing uh, to uh, quite a, uh, a developed process. There's uh, clearly more things that we can improve on it, uh, but uh, the experience that we found very much depended on when the service uh, was onboarded. Um, there were uh, a number of questions here. What's your overall experience uh, in participating with the EOSC? Uh, what do you hope to get out of participation either now or in the future as it further develops. Uh, what's your experience of the onboarding process itself from one to five, one very good, uh, uh, sorry, one very poor to five very good. Um, and what's your most urgent area uh, for improvement uh, of EOSC and any other information that you'd care to provide, a mixture of uh, free text and, and scores. Uh, so uh, we had um, nine responses, three anonymous, not a huge number, nevertheless, uh, some very interesting um, and useful feedback that we gained uh, from this exercise, and we will want to do another one before the end of the project. Uh, so as far as the scores are concerned, uh, 2.6 out of 5 for overall experience in participating with the EOSC, uh, slightly better from the onboarding process itself um, at 3.1. Um, and as far as the actual uh, analysis of the free text information uh, is concerned, uh, for EOSC, um, the, the main problem uh, we understood was a real mismatch between um, what the expectations are and what can actually be provided at present. Uh, a number of the respondents uh, uh, alluded to the fact that when they onboarded to EOSC, they expected um, a market increase in the number of users, which they felt weren't really for forthcoming at present. Um, and we uh, really took this to mean that we should try harder in actively marketing, um, uh, doing marketing within the project um, and in EOSC uh, in general. Um, this is something that we would uh, like to raise uh, within the project uh, EOSC Hub, uh, EOSC Enhance, and also within follow-up projects uh, in Free EOSC 03 with the working groups and with the executive uh, board as well. Um, another aspect was the expectation of 
a way of programmatically order resources. Um, at the moment, uh, this cannot be done. Resources can be ordered, but only uh, via manual uh, intervention. Um, this is really an aspect of uh, requirements uh, that can be fed into the various development roadmaps, for example, within the portal um, and the marketplace. Um, another interesting uh, feedback was um, service providers who are expecting uh, funding uh, through virtual access to be made available to them. Now, this is not possible at the moment, um, although there are discussions within uh, the Commission about the, the shape of virtual access funding uh, in the future, and this may well be uh, made possible. Uh, we don't know yet, essentially. So, um, apart from uh, requirements being fed into the development roadmaps, uh, the other thing that we took away with this feedback is that there is really a need for clearer documentation during the onboarding process of what onboarding actually means, um, what does it actually mean joining uh, EOSC and, and also what it doesn't mean uh, as well. On the second aspect, that of the actual onboarding process uh, itself, um, uh, some points were raised that uh, it is uh, quite a lengthy uh, process. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, related to requirements that are not being met on the provider's side. So um, what I mean here is that uh, uh, in order to onboard, there are a number of things that need to be met, a number of criteria that need to be met. Um, and sometimes this was not made very clearly to the onboarded service providers Again, that comes down to uh, clearer documentation. Um, uh, what are the maturity related requirements that are needed to be in place? Uh, for example, uh, we could be providing um, a sample AUP, which is uh, drawing to what uh, Dave was uh, talking about earlier on, uh, because having an AUP in place is a requirement. Uh, but if um, it's unknown what actually that AUP uh, looks like or or what it could look like, it could be very minimal, then that is a real barrier. So by making a sample AOP uh, available to them could really help in such instances. Uh, poor communication was highlighted as another uh, issue raised with uh, onboarding um, uh, to, to do with uh, the early onboarding of services. Um, um, and this, I think, uh, was related to earlier on in the process when we hadn't actually implemented uh, the proper rotors uh, for people to actually take on um, the, the, uh, the requests and then the follow-up requests as well. That is improving, but I think that there is always scope for improved communication. Uh, another point was um, the lack of being able to update service description templates uh, post onboarding. So initially information is given to us through the onboarding process. Uh, it, it's uploaded for people to uh, discover information about those services. At present, there is no easy way of updating the inf this information. Uh, again, this is really a question of missing uh, functionality that is really needed. Understanding what those requirements are is very important for us. And then we can take those requirements and ensure that they are fed into the various development roadmaps, both within this project and the follow on project. So I'm kind of hopeful that this can um, ring true with some of the people uh, in this call. And um, I'm very happy to uh, open up uh, points that people feel uh, that should be. And also uh, some other questions I have here uh, are relate, really relating to, are there other expectations that you have uh, what EOS uh, can potentially deliver now? Uh, clearly, we all appreciate that it is a very complicated uh, uh, thing, this uh, new EOSC, um, and it could potentially deliver a lot of things in the future um, and uh, fewer things uh, in the present, which are nevertheless things that we can uh, deliver. What about in uh, communication? Uh, what ways can we uh, uh, improve that? Uh, so videos were mentioned earlier on. Uh, this is uh, something that we could certainly uh, continue to do. Um, also engagement with the service providers. Is the service provider forum um, uh, in the mailing list and 
um, in the events and webinars have, have been mentioned adequate or should we be looking at other things? The other question I have uh, is the regarding the minimum viable EOSC services which have been uh, discussed at length over the last few days. Uh, I don't want to bring all of this up but um, from the point of view of service providers do these services um, that exist in the proposed minimum viable EOSC meet your needs or should there be other things that um, aren't there that aren't being considered at present. Uh, so we're now um, into the open uh, last 15 minutes uh, of, of the session and I'll be very happy indeed to open this up to uh, anybody who would like to uh, raise any questions or uh, provide any thoughts about this. So service providers, the floor is yours now. Anyone is uh, free, I think, to unmute their microphone. So um, any thoughts? Silence, does that mean everybody is happy? One thing I could bring up in the meantime is a link to the uh, onboarding uh, requirements, which I can share. There's been a few questions about them at present. It is very active, uh, but this is the criteria that we are using at present during onboarding. Um, in the chat, I know that there's been some discussion about what actually uh, constitutes a, a service. Um, uh, is a service uh, uh, an infrastructure? An infrastructure as a service, for example, cloud, um, HTC, uh, and can it be onboarded at present? Uh, the answer to that uh, is uh, no. So we aren't currently uh, onboarding through this onboarding mechanism infrastructures, but discrete services. And we use the definition according to FITSM at the bottom of this screen. No, Rob, if we've got any further questions through on Sligo. I'm checking at the moment. Um, so we have one from Dusan, uh, but I'm not sure if this is uh, let me just let me just share my screen as well. Um, Okay. Question from Dushan. I think I uh, um, responded partially to uh, in the chat and the question about aspects of uh, service management. Um, and is there a minimum level of requirements to be completed in order to register a service uh, in the OSC catalogue? Um, well, the answer to that is uh, no. Um, we, although we do expect services to have attained at least an advanced TRL 7, if not TRL 8. So they need to be essentially production quality. And that kind of implies that there does need to be 
um, a mature service management system in place on the side of the service provider. Other aspects, uh, for example, uh, aspects of information security um, and uh, uh, AUPs also imply that there need to be uh, a mature service management system. But certainly um, having, for example, knowledge of FITSM, uh, ITSM uh, will, will definitely help you. Does that answer your question, Dushan? Another question from uh, Pavel, can the community service be integrated at a technical level without being onboarded? That's an interesting one, Pavel. <laughs> So I guess uh, potentially the answer to that is uh, yes, for example, they could be making use of uh, EOS Cub um, uh, AAI services. Uh, so that could happen already uh, without necessarily being onboarded as a service in its own right. Yeah, I'm getting this question permanently from our colleagues. Um, and um, there's a use case to integrate the storage and um, they want first to uh, prepare the prototype uh, integration path, but and later on go uh, via onboarding process. And that was uh, the question. Thank you. So if it's positive, then I will also can propagate it further. Yeah. Maybe, um, Gergay, this is something potentially that could be touched upon in your integration handbook, the actual workflow of, uh, uh, and the fact that there doesn't necessarily need to be a coupling of onboarding plus integration. Sure, sure. But integration with the technical level without being onboarded is basically means that I want to use a service which is in EOSC already. So you just kind of order that service to be used by you. Uh, Gergli, it's not about only ordering, it's uh, really about integration uh, quite uh, significant integration with, for example, AI system. So it's not that uh, the people want to order it and, and use it um, separately, but really integrate uh, their systems with AI or monitoring, but without uh, putting the service on the marketplace, for example, and without uh, publishing it and promoting, but uh, first uh, go with the technical integration. That, that is the, the, the use case and... Yes, I, I understand that. But the ordering, I, I don't like that word ordering. <laughs> uh, it's, it's access request, right? You want to access that service because you want to do something with it. You want to uh, use it as a backend of your system. You want to integrate with the monitoring. You want to integrate with accounting. Ex that's, yeah, a, that's an yeah. access request. So to deal with that, you need to request access to that by sending an order. That's what I'm saying. It's not an access, it's, a, it's a more integration. So it's not that I need to, to enter uh, or join. I mean, yeah, it's, it's some sort of join, but it requires some technical uh, integration and uh, enabling of, of this um, integration. Okay, do we have uh, any other questions? We've got a few more minutes to go before the end of the session. I'm especially interested on the communication side if uh, people think that we should be providing information or uh, updates and we are not. So if you do have any thoughts on that, then please do uh, let me know either now or privately. If there are no more questions, then I think we could probably uh, finish for lunch. Thank you very much indeed, and apologies for the technical problems we had earlier. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye.